Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for coming back. Uh, welcome to the Pleasuring Shed and the making of Black Bottom Floats. So thank you for watching the first episode. That's really kind of you. And in that episode, I did promise that we would be making a float. So here is the float that we're going to be making. It's the Bamboo Waggler. Um, I hope you've got all your materials ready. If you have, let's crack on. So the first thing we're going to need to find is a piece of bamboo. So I'm lucky enough to have in my garden my own bamboo bush. So I've taken a cutting from this bush and this is what we're going to use to cut into sections and turn into our floats. The bottom of the stem is usually thicker and so we can use these pieces of stem uh, and we can cut them into sections. They'll be slightly thicker and will possibly take slightly more shotting weight and make a slightly heavier type of float. At the top end of the bamboo will be slightly thinner and we'll, we'll, we can make these into floats requiring slightly less shotting weight, giving you a more sensitive float. So let's get this cane cut into sections and then we can take a look at the different thicknesses and work out which one we want to use for our float. So what I'm going to do now is measure the length of the stem that I want to cut and we'll get that cut. So very simply, place your stem against the ruler, find yourself a pencil and mark out the length that you want. Now I'm going for a 12 and a half centimetre, so that's 12.5 centimetres. So we'll just mark that at 12.5. There we are, nice and simple. And then I'm going to go and get that cut. So we're going to cut the stem now. So I use a little razor saw. Uh, it's nothing fancy, cheap from your DIY stores. Uh, I'm just going to use that to cut the stem. So mind your fingers and start off with a nice easy sawing motion to begin with. And just keep going until you've cut all the way through the stem. So now I've got my piece of bamboo cut to length. The next thing I'm going to want to do is just sand it off. The bamboo does have a bit of a waxy coating to it and when we come to varnish it it might affect the way the varnish sits on the bamboo cane. So we're going to nib that off and just to give something for the varnish to key into. It'll also make it slightly grippier, but when we start whipping it as well, the thread will grip to it a little better as well. So take your sanding block and just give it a good old sand. That's it, all the way around, both ends, and just keep sanding until the stem goes dull and matte. We don't want any shiny surface on it at all. So now that the bamboo stem is sanded, we want to shape the end of the stem. Um, so I've got an offcut of, of bamboo here just to demonstrate a couple of techniques. Now I personally am going to sand it. Um, I could use my sanding block, um, but I do have an electric sander that I probably will use. But there are a couple of other options available. One of them, quite simply, is using a pencil sharpener, I don't know if you can see that. So using a pencil sharpener, I've got the one with the two different sizes uh, because the bamboo can be thicker or thinner. So on this particular piece of bamboo, I'm going to use the fatter end or the fatter hole for the, the, the pencil sharpener and I'm just going to sharpen it like a pencil and it works quite well. Now the risk of this is that sometimes it can actually tear uh, the, the surface of the bamboo so you do need a nice good sharp sharpener and just keep turning it and turning it until you have a bevel to the edge. So if I pop that down there you can see that the end of that piece of stem is starting to bevel inwards uh, and that's what we want. But I'm going to sand mine down using the sander so I'll show you what I've done once I've sanded it. So our next job is to take the bamboo skewer and place that into the end of the bamboo, uh, bamboo cane. The reason we're doing this is it's going to create the little leg section here uh, to which we're going to whip the eyelet. We'll talk about that in just a little while. Um, when I place the cane inside, uh, or rather the skewer inside the cane, um, it is a little bit wobbly, it's a little bit loose. So we're just going to thicken up the skewer end there with a little bit of masking tape and that will make it a nice snug fit and then we can glue that in place. So take an ordinary piece of masking tape. We don't need very much at all. A small section like that. And we're going to place that in a couple of centimetres down onto the skewer and then we're just going to slowly wrap that round 
So it's all sitting nice and flat and flush. Like so. And then that is going to allow us to get a better, snugger fit. There we are into the cane itself. So you can see that's really nice and tight now. There's no play there at all. So what we need to do now is take it back out, drop some glue in it and glue it into place. So take that out. I'm using uh, ordinary super glue. I can get this from any supermarket, get it online, get it anywhere really. Um, I like to use a good super glue because it dries nicely quickly and it gives a really good strong bond. So let's get some glue in it. Now I tend to place the glue on the beveled end of the cane rather than smear it over the skewer. And then as I place the skewer into the cane, it drags the glue down and makes a good, nice tight bond. So we want a little bit of glue on the end. Here it comes. See what I'm doing. There we are. And then taking the bamboo skewer back inside the cane there, just squeezing it down again it's a nice snug fit a little bit of twisting as well it just helps spread the glue and there we are that's a nice snug fit now um, we'll leave that for a couple of minutes just to let the glue dry off so now the glue's set the next job to do is mark the length of the little leg end whatever you want to call it uh, we're going to put the eyelet on the end of that um, so i like to have two and a half to three centimeters. We don't want it too short because when we whip the eye on, it will look a bit odd. We don't want it too long either because that then extends the length of the waggler. So I'm just gonna use my pencil and a ruler and mark uh, a couple of centimeters. So I like to use two and a half centimeters. Again, it's personal choice. You can have it as long as you want. I wouldn't go too short as I said, but two and a half to three centimeters is a really good distance or a good length. So that's marked. And really simply, I'm going to use a pair of side cutters and snip that off. Mind your fingers. Done. There we are. So now I'm going to shape this end of the stalk here. Uh, I want that, again, a little bit beveled. So when we put the eyelet on and we whip over the top of that, the, line, the, the thread will lay nicely onto there. So again, just using your sanding block and sand it down. So I'll find it easier this time to place the sanding block down and then we're just gonna rub the stem against the sanding block. And what we wanna do, like I said, is just taper in that edge there uh, so we get a nice finish to it. So I'm just sanding off. It doesn't take very much effort at all. These sand, uh, bamboo skewers are really quite easy to sand. And just keep slowly rotating so you get a nice even bevel all the way around. And you can already see that beginning to take shape there. Uh, so a little bit more on that, and that will be ready for an eyelet. There we are. Can you see that now? Can you see how that's beginning to taper in? And what I also do like to do is just flatten two sides. So with my finger over the top, I'm just going to flatten two sides. One on the top and one on the bottom. Again, this is just because it makes it easier when you start whipping over the top of it, it just helps the thread lay down on that a little bit easier. So there we are. So the next thing I'm gonna do is block up the little hole at the other end of the bamboo cane. We don't want water getting in, and also we want a nice flat top for when we start to paint it. So this again is really, really simple. We're gonna take the other piece of bamboo skewer that we cut off, and we're gonna place that into the hole. Now the hole at this end is slightly tighter, so the bamboo skewer actually fits in there really snugly. I don't need to put any tape on it, but if the hole was bigger, same process as we did the other end. So all I need to do then is take my super glue again, put a little bit of a, of a dab of glue at the top, just under the hole, and take my bamboo skewer, Again, I'm going to go in probably about a centimetre or so. Just slide it in there. And there we are. I'm just going to let that dry for a, a few seconds, just so it bonds. And then again, using the side cutters, I'm going to cut right up flush against the bamboo cane there. Don't worry if you, if you get a little rough bit, because we'll just sand that off. So using the side cutters, 
snip that off. And as you can see, we've got a little bit sticking out at the top, but that's not a problem because we'll just bring back the sandpaper and we'll just rub that off. And there we are. You can see now that's all nice and flat and ready for painting. Something else you could do if you choose to is just take the edge off this top section. This is a little bit sharp. So what I like to do then is just rub it down and it just loses that sharp edge at the top there uh, and, and makes it slightly nicer when we come to paint it. Don't forget when you're sanding indoors, uh, make sure you've got a well ventilated area. If you suffer from any respiratory uh, conditions, it might be worth wearing a mask because the dust from the, the bamboo can be a little bit irritating. So just get that edge off. And there we are. Okay, so now we've got our basic float shape with our little foot piece there uh, stuck into the hole. What we need to do now is whip on our little eyelet. And there's a few things we need to do before we can whip on the eyelet. So first of all, we need an eyelet. So I'm going to take one safety pin. And what I'm going to do is use my side cutters to just cut off the head of that safety pin. Just going to remove that, snip it off. And there you can see is our eyelet. So we're going to put that onto the foot of the float in just a minute. But before we do that, there's something else we need to do. And that is to take a piece of fishing line. You can use fishing line. I like to use fishing line because it's quite strong. Now this is going to be used to create a loop for which we're going to pull the thread through once we finished our whipping. It'll all be explained in just a minute. So this is the way I like to do it. I'm sure there are other ways of doing it, but this is the way I like to do it. So a piece of fishing line, probably, I don't know, 20, 30 centimeters long, Snip it off. It doesn't have to be expensive line, so please don't use all the good stuff. I've just got a cheap fishing line there. I'm going to make a loop using a technical one, a figure of eight loop knot. So wrapping it round and tucking it in again. Any old knot will do as long as it gives you a loop. A bit fiddly. So We've got a little loop, so we're going to keep that to one side because we're going to need it later. Now it's quite difficult to see, so when you put it down, remember where you put it. Uh, I'm going to hang mine just on a little rack I've got there. Um, so now what we need to do is whip this eyelet onto the end of the, 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 the foot end there. So I'm going to take the scalpel, and what I want to do is put a little split just right on the end of that little foot there, where we've sanded it off into a little tapered shape there. I just want to put a split in it. So right down the centre, very, very carefully, put a little split in it, just like so. And then what we're going to do is take our thread of choice. Now I'm using a black thread because uh, all my floats, nearly all of my floats, have black thread on the bottom, hence the name, black bottom floats. And I'm going to place it on there, if you can see that, and then I'm going to pull the thread through into that little split that I've just made. I hope you can see that there. Now with a lighter, I'm just going to burn off this little stumpy bit here, this little thread end, and then squash it down so it's nice and flat. And now that's quite secure in there for when I start to whip on the eye. I'll take the eye, just open it up slightly. This is a bit fiddly. So I hope I can get it all on camera. Pinch it between your fingers. Place it over the end. And what you want is the eye to be into the flat ends, if you know what I mean. So it, it tapers down to the eye. I hope that makes sense to you. And then we begin to wrap. So we'll start by Going round the back, I say this is just the way I do it. I'm sure there are lots of other ways of doing it. You don't have to copy me, but this is the way I do it. So once we've got three or four wraps on there, what I can then do is let go of the eyelet itself, and that should hold in place. 
and now I can begin spinning it in my fingers. So I'm just going to continue wrapping it round. Nice and steady. It doesn't matter on this first run if there's a few gaps in the thread because we're going to come back on it in a moment and that will cover in any of the holes. So I'm going to whip right up almost to the end of the of the the ring there. Just go right up to the end. I don't want to go on to the ring because I want that ring to be nice and big for you know making it easy to get your line through it. it makes it easier in the long run. So you can see now as I start to whip back the other way, there's no more gaps. Those gaps are being covered up quite nicely by that second layer of whipping. And like I say, there I'm sure there are lots of different ways of doing this. But this is the way I do it. There's whipping machines you can get where you, you know, it holds the bobbin for you and you can use gravity to help you keep the tension on it. And while we're talking of tension, keeping that thread reasonably taut there, I don't want to put too much pressure on it because I might snap the thread. And if you are using a cotton thread, you really need to be aware of that because a cotton thread will snap a lot easier than a nylon thread. So continue to whip round. Again, just keeping that tension on reasonably, not too much. I don't want to let it loose either. And whatever you do, don't let go of the thread. If you need to change your hand position, gather more thread, put your finger on it so it doesn't come spinning off the end of the of where you've just whipped. Then you can adjust your hand, regather the thread, put a bit of tension on it, and then carry on from where you left off. Now, as I get to the end of the little legs of my eyelet, just here, they could be a little bit sharp. So just loosen the tension slightly. If you pull it too tight, those sharp ends might just cut the thread and you'll have to start all over again. So I just loosen the tension until the thread drops off those. There we are, squash it all up so it all looks nice. And then we can continue whipping. Now I'm not going to whip like this all the way up the stem. So what I'm going to do is just change the angle of it so we get a nice spiral effect. It saves on thread and it looks pretty. Now we get to the bit where we can just see that little bit of masking tape. If you remember, we filled out the spacing there with masking tape. So we're just going to whip onto that. Another little tip when you're whipping is always whip uphill. So you can see where the, the, the taper is there on the end of the, of the float. So I'm going to be whipping up that. We don't want to be whipping down. If you whip down the slope, it gets loose and it, 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 yeah, it's not very good. So whipping up the slope, each new line of thread you put on helps hold the one before it. So you get a nice even lay of line. So make sure you don't go back over yourself. Keep on going. Now I'm going to keep going all the way up to the top. Okay, so we have whipped all the way up across the, the, the bottom of the float now. What I want to do now is finish this off. Now, it's entirely up to you what you want to do from here. You can continue whipping for as far up the stem of the float as you want to. I've got it as far as I want it to go. So what I need to do is just finish off that whip and get it to hold in place. So the next bit we need to do is take that little uh, knot and loop of fishing line that we made earlier on, and we're going to use that to help us finish off the whipping. So with the loop end facing down towards what will be the top of the float, and that's not too confusing, we're going to place it underneath our thread. Now what's really important here is when you place it underneath the thread is that you don't let that finger go. If you let the pressure off that finger, all of this whipping will just spring undone. So we've got to keep the pressure on there while we're putting that. So it's using lots of different fingers. It's quite fiddly, but you'll get used to it with practice. So that little loop of fishing line is now underneath this thread. So now I'm going to just going to continue to whip over the top of that little 
bow of line there, that little loop of line. So I'm just going to continue to whip round that. And probably three, maybe four passes of that. Again, keeping the tension on. Again, not too much because we don't want to snap the line, but not too little so that it all unravels. So that's three passes. I'm going to do a fourth one. So we've got four passes over the top of that little loop. So next thing to do is clamp the thread down again with your finger. Don't let that go because it will all come undone. You can let the other end go. And we're going to take our pair of scissors and we're going to snip off a tag end. So you need to leave a few inches on this. I don't know, maybe three or four inches. Just snip it off, well, not even that long, two or three inches. So the other thread now doesn't need to be used. So remember, don't let go of your finger. With the tag end, we're going to pass it through the loop. I hope you can see that. We're going to pass it through the loop. So it sits inside the loop. Then we're going to take the other end, the, the thread end of the knot, if you like, and we're going to pull. And that is going to trap that little loose end of thread and it's going to pull it underneath the threads that we whipped over. So there we are. That's it. Now with that done, that will hold that in place. So I can let go now and you can see that we've got a nicely whipped end on that float. All I need to do is trim off this tag end. So remember we talked about using a very sharp blade. This is where we need that sharp blade. So I've got my scalpel blade here. Be very careful, please. Um, adult supervision may be required. I'm going to just snip off the tag end. You can see how easily it cut through it. And there we are. We have our eyelet whipped on. We have a little bit of decoration there and it's nicely whipped up onto the shaft shaft of the of the float. So there we are. We have now whipped on our eyelet and we've got a little bit of decorative whipping there as well. Now that is absolutely fine to use that as it is. There's no need for you to add any more if you don't want to. I'm going to add a little bit of colour to mine um, and there's a slightly different way of, of doing the whipping but that's something I'll show you in a future video. But for now, how you, you whip up there and how I finished off the whipping, that's how it's done. And you can use that to your to your advantage and, and just go as far up the stem as you want to. You can do a little bit more of the decorative whipping, just like we've done here. Um, whatever takes your fancy. But how we finished it off using the little bit of fishing line on the end there and wrapping over the top of it, that's how you would finish it wherever you choose to finish. So I'm going to go and add some colour now and uh, I'll come back to you in just a minute. So we've got our float back now and you can see I've added a little bit of uh, red whipping there and finished it off with the black. So we've got a nice little color variations. And as I explained, I will demonstrate how to do this second type of whipping because the start of it is slightly different. I'll do that in another video. What you've done with your, with your standard whipping, it's absolutely fine. Now, what I wanna do before I do anything else to this float is I wanna just seal off and secure the threads that I've already painted. So, for example, if I start handling the float like this with the threads down in my palm, um, there is a very good chance that the threads will start to come loose. And I don't want that to happen because it's taken me a long time to get that whipping just the way I want it. So what I'm gonna do is use a product. Uh, it's a water-based varnish. This particular one is from Rustins, but any water-based varnish will do. What that does, is it acts as a sealant on that thread and it kind of acts like a bit like a glue as well. And once that coating of varnish is over the top of the threads, it seals it, it stabilizes it. I can handle it a lot more freely and it will be easier for me to work with the float. Let's get the tin open and let's give it a good old stir. So any old paintbrush, a soft bristle brush will do. Nice small one, sort of modeling brush sizes. You don't want massive, great, big, thick brushes, but modeling brush size. Make sure there's no dust on it. And then just give it a little dip. I'm just gonna paint the end, or varnish the end. Just give it a little coating. You can see that the varnish actually comes out white, which is quite handy. 
is you can see where you varnished. If it was a clear varnish, it would be a little bit more tricky. I'm just going to give that a good old coating. It doesn't have to look special. Now there is a, a, a school of thought that say you should dip the floats into the varnish, but personally, I don't like that. I think it's a little bit of a waste. Um, I think brushing it is a lot easier and it really gets into all the cracks and crevices of the threads. And there we are, that's all we're gonna do. I'm not gonna varnish all the way up the shaft of the float. I'm just doing the bits where I've whipped. So there we go. So you see we've varnished on that. You can see how it's gone white, but don't worry, as it dries, it will dry clear. And that will give you a nice coat of varnish. We'll be adding lots more varnish to it as we go on, but we'll leave that for now. So we're gonna hang that up to dry and we'll come back in a few minutes once it's dry. So we finished the bottom end of our float now. The varnish is on touch dry it's not completely dry but it's touch dry so that's that's good enough for me we can carry on working from there so we finished this end so what we're going to do now is turn the float over and we're going to start working at the top end of the float as well so now we need to start making it more colorful and bright so it's visible in the water how far down you um you make your color tip is entirely up to you uh, and what what we are going to do is start with a nice white base coat and for that, I use just good old fashioned modeling paint. Um, get it from any modeling store. I'm going to start with a flat matte white. Um, this one is Revel number no. five matte, uh, which is just a plain white. And we're going to measure out how far down I want the color to come down onto the tip of the float. And yeah, let's do that. So I need a pencil and a ruler. I like about three centimeters. Again, like I say, you can do it any length you want to. And I'm just going to put a little pencil line roughly at three centimeters. There we are. I hope you can see that little pencil line there. And this end is going to be where I paint it white. So I've got my paint ready, and it's just a simple case of putting the paint on and painting it. Just nice, even strokes. And keep doing that all the way around until we've got a nice even coat. You might need to apply two coats of the white just so you get a, a good covering and it's nice even white. Um, if you get dark bits in it, because the, the, the luminous paint that we're going to use over the top is quite thin, it can be quite opaque, which is why we're using a white base. Uh, if we've got dark shadows within that white base, it can actually still show through in the uh, in the luminous paint when we apply that so we want a nice covering on that nice and even and then of course don't forget the end as well doing that a good cover again there is a school of thought that says you can dip the paint uh, dip the float rather into the paint personally i don't like that i think it's a little bit wasteful but, uh, but there we are so nice even coat of paint and we're going to hang that up to dry now. Okay, so I've cleaned my brush from the white paint um, and I'm now about to apply the, the yellow paint. So let's get on to that. So here we go, same as before, just dipping your base brush in and just giving it a good old coat of the yellow. Um, again, it might need two coats, but if you've got a good base layer on uh, and that base layer of white is nice and even, then the yellow should go on quite nicely and give you a nice even coat without any patches or blobs in it. There we are all the way around. If you've noticed any differences in the float, and that's because the time it takes to things to dry and for the video to be made, I've had to do a bit of a, a Blue Peter special, and here's one I made earlier. So yeah, there we are. So that's finished now. But again, I'm gonna leave that to dry. This kind of paint actually dries quite quickly within sort of 10, 15 minutes. It's quite dry and easy enough to put on the next coat. So we've got the yellow painted onto the float now. Now as it stands, that is a perfectly usable float. We could put a coat of varnish on that um, and it's ready to roll. You don't have to add any detail to the tip there. You don't have to add any of the whipping or any different colors. As it is, it's a perfectly good float. Personally, my personal choice is I like red or orange tips with a yellow base. Um, that makes it slightly easier for when you are fishing. Uh, if you get a slight lift bite, 
you get that difference between the two colors and it's slightly easier to detect the bite. So what we're gonna do is measure down probably about two centimeters, make a little line, and then we're gonna paint that into a red or an orange color. Uh, the paint I'm gonna use for that, again, it's another Revel paint. It's another satin matte, and this one is 332. So let's get that measured and we'll get it painted. So I'll bring my ruler back in. And again, like I said, about two centimeters there. So this end of the float is going to be the red color and the bottom end of the tip here is going to be staying yellow. So let's get that painted. So I've got my little mark where I want to paint to. So it's just now a case of, same as before, dipping your brush in and just painting over straight over the yellow. It's a nice base coat color. Um, again, it might take two coats um, to, to do this. But let's get it all covered nice and evenly all the way around. Get the idea. Don't worry too much if the line here isn't that neat. It's personal choice. Again, just like we, we had the full yellow, if you painted the red bit at the top and left it like that, that's absolutely fine. Again, it's a perfectly workable float. But what I'm going to do is give it a second coat of that once that's dried off. And then I'm going to do a bit of extra whipping just around the join between the yellow and the red or the yellow and the orange there. And that just neatens it up and gives it a nice neat finish. Again, that's personal choice. You can do it however you want to, but we'll show you the whipping once this paint has dried off. So that will be the next stage of the float. So we've got the uh, orange now painted onto the tip of the float. So you can see the contrast between the two colors. What I want to do now is just neaten up the join between these two colors. And I'm going to do that by whipping over the top of it, putting a small band of whipping on, um, and it just makes it nice and neat. Also, another point to make at this stage is after you've put this coat of paint on or any other paint that you're going to use and whip over the top of, really make sure it hardens off. So leave it overnight, give it a good, 12 to 18 hours of drying time so that the coat goes nice and hard. If you put the whipping onto quite fresh paint, you know, something that's only been dried for an hour or so, it's touch dry, but the whipping will cut into it and you'll end up, the, the paint will kind of smudge around the, the side of the whipping. So really let that go off nice and firm. So 12 hours, 24 hours, something like that, uh, and let that go off. Okay, so let's start talking about the whipping now. So I'm gonna just use a black thread um so here we are black thread now i'm going to have to start off the whipping slightly differently if you remember i trapped the thread at the bottom of the stem there when we did that bottom whipping but how i add the red whipping here and this little bit of black is the technique that i'm going to show you now so it's slightly different so here we go so we're going to place the thread onto the float and i'm going to trap it under my thumb then I'm going to go around the back of the float and just ripping, whipping around the top. And what I want to do eventually is doing a few wraps, trap the thread underneath. And let's go around again. I hope you can see this. I'm just going to trap that thread underneath. I'm just going to squash that up so it's all nice and neat. Don't worry about this little tag end. We'll deal with that in a moment. So we want three or four wraps around. Make sure that's all squashed up nice and neat. Try not to go over the top of your previous whipping. So you're constantly whipping down. So there we are. So you can see the little tag end here. Remember, don't remove that finger. Hold that on tight. If you let go, it will just spring off again. So what I need to do now is just cut off this tag end. So take the, 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 the thread out of your way, grab your really sharp scalpel blade, and you're just going to place it on there and nip off that little tag end. Should come off. There we are. That's off now. What we're gonna do is just continue to whip round a couple more turns just to neaten that off. 
Now, you could at this stage use the uh, little bit of fishing line loop that we made, tuck it underneath, wrap around a few times, and cut it off like we showed you before. But what I like to do is just whip through the yellow and just come down to give it a nice pattern. Again, you don't have to do this, this is my personal choice. And I'm going to add another band at the bottom, which will neaten up the bottom end of the color as well where the yellow meets the stem of the float, the bamboo. We'll do three or four wraps on that, maybe a few more. Make sure that's all squashed up nice and tight. Pinch it down and let go of the thread. Now I need my piece of fishing line from earlier. Tuck it underneath the thread. Clamp it down with your thumb. And then we're going to whip over the top of that. Again, three or four turns should do it. Again, keeping that tension on quite firm. So that's one, two, three. Now I'm going to leave it at three because the two bands are about the same thickness. So it just gives it a little bit of symmetry, if you like. It's aesthetically pleasing. So there we are. So what I need to do now is cut that off with the scissors. So I'm cutting off the main thread, leave a few inches. And then with this tag end, we're going to pass it through the loop. I hope you can see this. I'm going to pass it through the loop. So that's now inside the loop. And then the tag end of the loop there, I'm going to pull that through. You should be able to see it pulling the thread through underneath where we've whipped your loop away somewhere where you'll find it again. Give that a little pull to make sure it's nice and tight. Check all the way around to make sure it's nice and even. And there we are, that's our whipping finished. The next thing to do is just slice off that tag end. Again, we need our scalpel for that. So using our scalpel blade, remember, please be careful with the blade. Just place it on and slice it off. And there we're done. Again, just neaten that up, and there we have an almost finished float. So there we are. You can see, if you can see that in the camera, the whipping's done. I've added a little bit more decorative red just to the top there, just to finish it off. You know, it's personal choice. Um, so now what we need to do is finish varnishing the whole float. So we've already varnished. We put a thin coat of varnish on this bottom section where the original whipping was. So now we're just going to do the rest of it. This will seal off this whipping at the top and stop that from ever coming loose. Uh, and then it will just give a nice coat and a nice finish to the whole float as well. So let's get on and paint that. So using the Rustin's water-based exterior varnish. Uh, an exterior varnish is pretty good. Uh, and again, we're just going to give that a nice even coating all the way around. You can be quite liberal with the varnish here. And remember, it might go on a sort of milky white color, but it will dry nice and clear, as you can see by the bottom end of the float where the original whipping was. Giving that a nice even coating, making sure it's getting in all the cracks and crevices where the, the whipping is, because remember that's slightly raised. We're just making sure by going backwards and forwards, it goes right inside. It doesn't matter if you go over the top of where you varnished before. Make sure you get the tip covered as well. And there we are. So we're going to hang that up to dry now. That'll take, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes to dry. So our float's finished. In the sense, it's got a nice coat of varnish on. It's nice and dry. Um, as it stands, that float is good to go. We could use that right now if we wanted to. It's got a protective coat of varnish on, but it's only got one coat on. So personally, I like to do three or four coats of varnish and finish that off with, a, with the top coat of yacht varnish, which we'll talk about in just a minute. But before we put any more varnish on, what I also like to do is add the shotting weight. And I write that on the stem of the float. So when I get my float out of my tackle box, pick it up and go, right, I want to use that float today. It takes X amount of shot and I can make it nice and quick to tackle up. So what I'm going to do then is use a bit of fishing line, get my shotting weights and put it into a tube of water, a glass of water, and get it to sit just where I want it. Now, ideally, 
I want my float to sit with the waterline just level with that top black line there. That's personal choice. You could have it sitting higher or lower. If I have it sitting on the line there, if the float is in the water, I can see a clear lift by it if I need to. I can also see the float being dragged under if I need to. But having it on that line is my personal choice. So let's get my shots together and we'll get that shotted. Okay, so I've got my, um, I don't know what you want to call it, a vase. It's actually a pasta jar. That's what it is, spaghetti. Um, so, but it makes a great shotting vessel uh, for putting the floats in and getting the shotting weight right. So I use a little bit of fishing line and I'm going to pass that through the eye. Now, the one thing about using bamboo floats, although they're free and easy to find the bamboo and easy to make, the shotting can actually be quite light. Um, You'd think with being such a big, heavy float, heavy looking float, it would take quite a lot of shot to, to cock it, but actually it can take quite a little. So I'm going to start off, I'm estimating that to be about 2BB, maybe three to four number one shot. So I'm going to start off with a number one shot. So I've got my little pots of shot here and I'm just going to attach it as if I would be attaching it to my fishing line. Fiddly. Using shot there that on that's one and on the other side just to stop it slipping off the line really need to wear my glasses there's two i'm going to go with a third and we'll see how it looks with three shot on there we'll see what i'm doing so you can see see that we've got one at the top and then two down the line. Okay, so we're going to put that in the water and see how it looks. Okay, you know what? That's pretty much spot on. That's sitting perfectly on that line, that top black line. You can see in the tube as well how I've moved the shot uh, down the line, almost like shirt button style. So when you're fishing and you're fishing much deeper, you'll move those shots down the line as you choose to do so. But actually, that's sitting pretty perfectly nice and buoyant. I don't know if you can just see it there, look. You can just see the water line just on that black line there. So that's pretty good. I'm happy with that. So let's take it out, get it dried off, and then we can write down on the float what the shotting weight is. So the float's nice and dry now. I've dried that off with a bit of tissue paper, got all the water off it, and now I'm going to use permanent marker pen just to write on there what the shotting weight was. So the shotting weight was three number ones. So using the permanent marker, I'm just going to write on there three number one. Not very neat this time, I'm afraid. So as you can see, I've just written on there three number ones. Um, and then when I get that out of my tackle box, I know exactly how much shot I've got to put on it. So that's done. What we need to do now is put another coat of clear varnish on it. So I'm going to use the same water-based varnish that I used earlier on. And I'm just going to give the whole float another coat um, just to seal that uh, writing in. It won't go anywhere with the yacht varnish on it, but I just want to seal it in with the uh, water-based varnish first. So that's what I'm going to do next. So I've added a second coat of varnish, uh, clear varnish, the water-based varnish that we used earlier. Um, so that's had a second coat completely, I left that to dry now. Um, so uh, my next project is to put the yacht varnish on. So yacht varnish is going to take a long time to dry, so you need to bear that in mind. So if I wanted to use the float today, it's all ready to go. That could work right now with two coats of varnish on it. Um, the problem with using the float with just the water-based varnish in, if you go for a long session, the varnish will start to go sort of slightly whitish in colour. Um, so it's not ideal. For a short session, a couple of hours, absolutely fine. It will be fine. Just make sure you dry the float out thoroughly once you finish with it. But to give the float a little bit of longevity and a little bit of life, putting a coat of uh, yacht varnish on it is pretty good. Different, uh, different types of finishes you can get. Um, this is a gloss finish. Um, I also use a satin finish as well. Um, but I'm going to use the gloss here um, just for this particular float. So let's get this one painted. 
Um, and, and it's exactly the same as we put on the water-based varnish. We're just going to use the, the yacht varnish instead. So we need to open up the tin. There we are. Nice big tin of Rustin's varnish. Find the paintbrush. Now bear in mind this is oil-based, so that your brushes will need to be cleaned off with uh, white spirit, something like that. Um, so personally, I like to start painting at the eyelet end of the float. And then I can only paint down a certain way um, because I've got to hold it at one end and I can't paint where I'm holding it. So I'll paint probably down to this red line here and then I'll hang that up to dry. Uh, it will probably go touch dry, able to handle it within about eight to 10 hours, um, but it won't, it won't be ready to use for probably another two weeks after that once the whole thing's been painted. So you really need a good long time for that varnish to harden off. So let's get the paintbrush, uh, some varnish on it, and let's get it varnished. So don't go mad. You don't need loads. It goes quite a long way. So just dip the tip of the brush in and then just start to coat. And we're going to continue to do this all the way around. Again, getting a nice, even coverage on it. You don't want it to go on too thick because if it goes on too thick, you run the risk of it running. You don't want big blobs of varnish down the float. Again, there is the school of thought that he says that you should dip it. Personally, I don't like dipping. I think it's a little bit wasteful. I've said that before. Um, so I'm just going to use the brush. Again, backwards and forwards with your brush in motion so that the varnish gets inside all of the threads. A little bit more. I'm going to move down the, the main shaft of the float now. Just give it a nice even spread. So I'm not going to go past the red line. And then I know once it's, this end has dried up, when I turn it over, I just need to varnish down to the red line. So got just about the right amount of varnish on that. I'm down to the line, as I've said. Uh, so now I'm going to hang this up to dry. Um, probably take eight to 10 hours to dry before I can start handling it. And once I can start handling it, I can then paint the tip section of the float as well. So I'm gonna hang that up to dry. This is where I hang up all my other floats to dry once I've painted them or varnished them. I'm just gonna leave that there now for the next, I don't know, eight, 10 hours, something like that. Don't forget as well, I've got these two floats which were part of my production and making them earlier. They're perfectly good floats to, to use. I could varnish them straight off now with the art varnish if I wanted to or I could finish them off with the whipping. The choice is yours. So don't forget those as you go. Um, here's the finished float. This is it. I've painted both ends um, or varnished both ends uh, and it's good to go. So this has been drying for a good couple of weeks now. The varnish is really nice and firm and hard. Um, so the next thing we need to do with this float, get out on the water. So I'll see you at the lakeside and let's see if we can catch a fish. Here you are, you join me bankside this time. Uh, we're out of the shed, out of the pleasuring shed, and we are on the lake. Uh, this is my local club water. It's absolutely rammed with fish, um, and it's a real good place to start testing out our floats. Um, but before we do that, let's talk a little bit about the tackle I'm using. Um, fishing doesn't have to be expensive, it really, really doesn't. Second hand rods, second hand reels, um, get them down charity shops sometimes. Um, you can pick them up on you know, well-known auction sites. Um, this one that I'm holding now came from a well-known auction site, it cost me a tenner. Um, it's an Edgar Seeley match blue float rod. Um, 10 pounds it cost me, cork handle. Um, we've got the real seats here, the real rings. Um, so you can position the reel anywhere up and down the handle wherever you prefer it. Uh, it's, it was probably 10 foot when it was new. I think it's just shy of 10 foot now. Um, I have, uh, put new eyes on it all the way down because the old ones were a bit old crusty and, and rusty um, so I replaced the eyes all the way down um, so there we are almost a brand new fishing rod for £10 plus the cost of the, the rings hello butterfly right so the reel I'm using again another eBay special uh, I think this cost me eight quid um, it's a Shimano Aero Perfection 3500 uh, there you go so that's it there Again, really basic rear drag um, and it's loaded with uh, eight pounds line 
um, you don't want anything more than that really for what the sort of fishing that we're doing um, yeah so that's the business end uh, let's go and look at the, the bottom end now obviously we know what float we're using so we've got our float so there we are that's our handmade float we made that in the shed um, and that we weighted at 6 BB so it's quite a heavy float um, and then I've spread the shot out down the line so I've got four of the shot up near the float you can see that four of the shot up near the float so that runs all the way down I've got two more shot at the bottom just where I've tied on my hook link so I've got a slightly uh, less weighted line at the bottom so that is a seven pound hook link on the bottom to a size 14 hook with a little bit of spam on the bottom um, and the reason I've got a slightly weaker hook link is if I get a snag and I pulled for a break I only use, lose this part of the line uh, I'm not going to lose my float because it spent us hours making that so I'll manage to save the float with a bit of luck um, so there we are so that's my setup dead simple really really simple um, yeah that's it let's get fishing pounds I would say maybe just shy of maybe a bit more difficult yeah beauty all caught on a handmade float Perfect. okay so thank you very much for watching the making of black bottom floats that's uh, hopefully that's given you a little bit of inspiration to go and make your own um, something else you can think about when you're walking around a lake or down along a river um, have a look out for some goose quills so here are some goose quills here. We've got a nice big goose quill here. I think this is a grey goose or a Canada goose. Lovely quill. Found it on the floor. No birds were harmed in the making of this quill. Um, but we're going to turn this to this. So again, a nice cheap float, free of charge. And uh, yeah, let's hope we can do that together. So join me again in the Pleasuring Shed and we'll see you soon. Don't forget, like and subscribe.